an icebreaker panel, the Western Balkans, between integration and fragmentation, moderated by Dr. Philippe Aidis. The topic of our panel is uh, very current, as the Western Balkan region finds itself at an important fork road. One path leads to further regional and European integration, as well as sustainable peace, while the other leads to fragmentation, stagnation, and potentially renewable uh, armed conflict. However, the topic of our discussion today also echoes a timeless geopolitical dilemma, not only of the Balkans, but I think of Europe as a whole. Look only after yourself, stay fragmented, quarrel with your neighbors, and remain collectively weak without the ability to make decisions for yourself. Or join forces, stay united, and create a larger political community that can take uh, decisions for itself and which can make a difference in the world. The integrationist project which started after the Second World War in Europe and which gained further momentum after the, the end of the Cold War is today probably in its deepest crisis ever. However, as Jean Monnet used to say, Europe will be made in, made in crisis or it will be not made at all. And I think this stands uh, through not only for Europe, but also for the region and for the European project in the region today as well. This topic will be further analyzed and unpacked by our distinguished panelists today. We have five extraordinary speakers. I will briefly introduce each and every one of them uh, before moving to our keynote speech uh, delivered by um, Dr. Professor Igor Lukšić. After that, we will have a discussion of about 40 minutes or so, which will leave us uh, probably half an hour for the questions uh, from the audience. So the first speaker will be uh, Professor Dr. Igor Lukšić, who I guess doesn't need a special introduction in this uh, forum, but let me do it anyway. It's a person with a stellar political career, which includes, among others, the positions of an MP, Deputy Prime Minister for European Integration, Foreign Minister, and Prime Minister of Montenegro. Mr. Lukšić is currently a director for uh, Southeast European region in PricewaterhouseCoopers. The second speaker uh, will be His Excellency Mr. Igor Crnadak, another person with an extraordinary political career. Currently, he serves as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Economist by training, Mr. Trnodak previously served in various capacities, including as the member of uh, the National Assembly of Republika Srpska and Deputy Minister of Defense of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Next up will be uh, Dr. Mil uh, Milo Šolaja, the founder of the Center for International Relations from Banja Luka, a think tank, and a well-known analyst and author of a number of publications and books in the field of international relations, security and defense policies, uh, and European integrations in the region. His book, Balkans in the Transatlantic Rift from 2006, has been for more than a decade an unavoidable literature for generations of students of Euro-Atlantic integration in the region. The fourth speaker is my colleague and friend, uh, Dr. Sandro Knezovic and a senior research associate at the Institute um, for Development in International Relations in Zagreb. Among other things, Sandro and I co-chair co a working group on uh, regional stability in Southeast Europe in the Partnership for Peace Consortium of Defense Academies and the Security Studies Institute. And he published um, extensively, but not only extensively, but of good quality publications and books and articles. And I would uh, particularly emphasize his book <coughs> Consolidation in Southeast Europe, the Role of External and Internal Factors, published in 2012. It's an excellent read for anyone who is interested in regional security in the Western Balkans. And last but not the least, I would like to introduce Mr. Dragan Šormaz, a seasoned politician from Serbia, currently the head of delegation of the National Assembly of the Republic of Serbia to the Parliamentary um, Assembly of NATO and a number of other committees in the National Assembly of um, Serbia. Without any further ado, 
Uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Lukšić. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Good evening to all. I have to admit that I have uh, had a, a great com comparative or competitive advantage. Uh, I happened to be seated last night next to Philip when we were flying back from Belgrade. So we had to we had some half an hour, 40 minutes to chat about to be secure and the concept of the panel. So I apologize to colleague panelists for that. Uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm sure he has prepared some interesting questions which should uh, bring us around this topic well together because I really believe uh, we are at an interesting point in time when uh, one discusses uh, the, the future of the region and provocative title of the panel, uh, Western Balkans between uh, fragmentation and integration is indeed uh, uh, in a way a place where we are right now. And uh, it is expected from all the stakeholders, and there are many, to be able to pass good decisions, to be able to look uh, towards uh, the future with vision and to make good decisions. And I certainly hope that events like this can help because uh, I have to say that I very much appreciate all the efforts of the Atlantic Council, Montenegro. I'm grateful for the invitation to take part in this year's event. It's great to be back. I think after almost a decade, it has become really an important security event and I'd like to appreciate Dr. Kentra's efforts uh, and his uh, particular mood uh, these days as we are about to end uh, the process of uh, making Montenegro member state of NATO, which is going to be an uh, incredibly important uh, event this year uh, when formally finished. But I'm sure every ending is only a new beginning, uh, opening up a whole new stage of, of activities that should further contribute to the stability and prosperity of the region. I'll come back to that in a minute or two. Uh, but I didn't ask uh, uh, Savo about how really serious we should be. Uh, I hope we should not be that serious because this is still an ice-breaking panel. This is not uh, you know, a formal and, and true forum which is supposed to start tomorrow. So I hope that uh, uh, in the course of, of, of the debate, we, we are able to really be, be fresh in thinking and innovative and uh, exchange, exchange views about where we are right now. Uh, let me step back and uh, try to offer you a background, which is really very important in order to understand where we are today in the Western Balkans and where we are heading, actually, because uh, this background, although very complex, is important to understand. Unfortunately, it is uh, so complex that Everything I'll say deserves not only a panel or, 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 or uh, uh, a couple of panels, but actually deserves a conference uh, to explain the impact on where we are uh, in, in, on how it can affect uh, the development of the Western Balkans in the near and, and uh, longer future. So let's start, of course. Uh, it is uh, inevitable to, uh, uh, to speak about the new political reality in the United States. Uh, the fact that uh, we have a new president, still new, uh, who has uh, been making important decisions every day in Montenegro. We are grateful that he has uh, made the decision to support uh, a bid to uh, membership. But it is also uh, important to, to uh, uh, notice that there's been a lot of changes in President Trump's approach towards foreign policy in the past several months. And uh, compared with what was some of the campaign pledges, and uh, I think for the good, I think it is it matters uh, that the new administration has taken uh, important decisions with regards to the NATO, with regards to some other international initiatives. But it's worthwhile mentioning this because it is important. Uh, to understand and to take into account this particular angle you know, to understand the future of the Western Balkans, how it will affect, will the, uh, the new US administration remain active and present to uh, the extent some of the previous ones were when it comes to the Western Balkans. 
Second, it's of course uh, EU uh, and the state of the EU and uh, the Brexit talks. Uh, very recently, uh, we had the opportunity of discussing about this at a similar event. And uh, a lot of attention went to the Brexit talks and uh, the need to uh, understand how it will affect the process of enlargement. I saw today uh, Federica Mogherini's tweet about, or, or it was an excerpt from the interview, whatever, uh, she was confident about the future of the EU and the fact that uh, enlargement will continue. Uh, even after Brexit, no more countries, Western Balkan countries uh, can hope to, to join. But there are so many question marks about how the process will go on. And unfortunately, it seems to all of us who follow the process that despite verbal support, despite continuous statements uh, and so on, uh, that most of the attention, most of the focus right now goes to how to handle Brexit talks. And when you have such a big uh, uh, issue to deal with, unfortunately, there can be uh, uh, many who, are, who will stay, stay aside. So we also expect to see how EU will formulate the approach towards the Western Balkans and towards its, 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 own, its own future. We need to take into account also the fact that globally uh, China becomes more and more important player and the background uh, I'm trying to offer you uh, to understand Western Balkans uh, because some of the initiatives also uh, affect what we do here. Uh, for example, uh, One Road, One Belt initiative is something which is uh, 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 pretty much a global initiative which shows the commitment of the People's Republic of China towards uh, global development, but it also has to do with some of the work we do in the Western Balkans. Uh, setting corridors, uh, discussing how to best use and tap resources in this region, how to better connect, and so on. Uh, let me also remind you that China is the only top 10 financier of the peacekeeping troops, which is also uh, one of the top 10 uh, countries that commit troops, because that does not necessarily match. Where you have United States or, or Great Britain or some other countries, from those so-called Geneva group contributing most to the peacekeeping uh, forces. On the other side, you have uh, countries like Ethiopia or Nepal and so on, who commit most of the forces, most of the troopers. So China is the only country that, uh, that uh, fits into both, both of the groups. And it shows her commitment uh, or interest in, in global, uh, further uh, global developments. Uh, last but not least, uh, since uh, some years ago, We've had also sustainable development goals as a particular agenda we need to take into account. And not much is said, especially in these parts. Uh, I've seen a research showing that most of the young people, for example, have never heard about Agenda 2030, which has to do with communication skills, obviously. But uh, it is also up to uh, the leaders of our countries to understand a better, better ma make a better connection between a truly global agenda, uh, one that uh, has come uh, uh, as a bottom-up process, although very complex, and uh, take a look and, 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 and give some scrutiny to that uh, versus uh, populism, versus fundamentalism, versus cyberspace issues. We're having uh, right now all those forces that probably drive attention away from what should be a harmonized and global development scheme, such as SDGs. So this is the background and where, uh, uh, where actually uh, we are uh, uh, in, in, in the Western Balkans. Uh, only six years ago, uh, I like to remind uh, uh, people that uh, although six years ago, should, six years should not be you know, too long a span, time span, but going back to 2011, for example, Croatia was still not a member of the EU, was a very fresh member of, of uh, NATO, Serbia, do, do you remember, was still uh, facing issues with ICTI, uh, was still not able to overcome that issue. I'm referring to International Court in, in, in The Hague uh, to overcome that, that issue and open up very tangible European perspective. Uh, 
Montenegro received seven benchmarks to meet in order to open uh, accession talks. And uh, to be honest with you, only a handful of people was optimistic that we could do it, but we did it. Uh, Albania was far from being a candidate even, not to mention talks. Uh, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina also uh, far, far away from being a candidate. Uh, Kosovo was still nowhere in the integration process. Uh, unfortunately, it is only Macedonia that more or less has remained stagnant for obvious reasons. But all other countries and all together, the trajectory of the region has been enormously positive. Enormously positive. But are we happy with that? Uh, can we say for sure that things are well, that we are on track of doing, uh, of doing a good job and uh, that there's a prosperous future ahead? If you talk to young people, I've shared some of uh, the views with my dear colleague, uh, Igor Tsunadak. Uh, there's a, there are young people who continue to leave our region, who are still interested, although they're well, I mean, well, well organized back home, but they're still uh, uh, sort of motivation less. They're, they're still uh, interested in changing the way uh, where they live. And it is a great danger, a big structural issue we have to be able to, to respond to. So uh, obviously, countries in the region cannot be left to their own devices. There has to be uh, very strong cooperation uh, um, uh, first of all, amongst ourselves in the region, and we need ever stronger and proactive uh, presence of the EU. That is, that is definitely my opinion. Uh, integration process has always uh, gone uh, hand in hand with security and stability in this region. And Croatia, Montenegro, Albania, now countries, uh, all the Adriatic countries, which make part of, of the NATO, it is of huge uh, importance to the stability and security of, of this part of the world and the whole northern, northern Mediterranean. But it is only three out of, uh, uh, four of, uh, out of seven countries in the Western Balkans. Uh, there is still uh, uh, some who don't think that their future is with, with NATO, uh, some have not yet decided, some unfortunately have not moved forward. So that is why European uh, Union should play incredibly important role. So what is it we can help with uh, in the region? I believe that uh, we need to make sure that we sort of uh, put away uh, 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 you know, day to day things which uh, impede cooperation. Uh, I, I, when we started with uh, Western Balkan 6 some years ago, and uh, I believe it has been one of the ideas that has brought forward uh, some initiatives that uh, eventually turned into something very tangible. We spoke about cooperation uh, uh, in the field of rule of law in the region. We spoke about connectivity, we spoke about boosting trade. And we already have some visible results. There are corridors for uh, transport, railways, roads. We know where those roads should be built, finally. Uh, we are eligible for EU funding, which is extremely important. Uh, uh, EU, European Union has identified some soft measures to improve transport corridors and the operation of transport corridors uh, uh, and energy transmission grids, incredibly important. Uh, but there's more to be done. Uh, these days, I've been reading uh, uh, about some ide ideas, initiatives, how to move things forward. Uh, and some ideas have been, have been mentioned, like, is it the customs union, the next step? Is it uh, uh, single market, the next step? European Commission talks about single market. Some countries are in favor. Some countries are skeptical. Some countries are anxious uh, if that can turn into something they don't want. I think it is, uh, that I think there's need to clarify situation. Western Balkan 6 has always been about accelerating uh, the membership of the Balkan countries into the EU, because that's where we should end up. Access to the big market, uh, no barriers, better standards, meeting benchmarks, more prosperity and, and, and stability. So what we need for sure, in my opinion, 
is in a way SEFTA plus. You know, SEFTA is free trade agreement in the region. So SEFTA plus is something we need. We need more mobility in the region. We need definitely those soft measures in place to make sure that once those roads are built, are not useless, but people and, and trucks and every, lorries, uh, cars can, uh, can, can move around without barriers. We need to uh, uh, expand our uh, IT communication uh, in order to <clears throat> make sure that investors are able to see us as a not 7 million or 3 million or 4 million market, but at least 20 million market. But that's the point, to make sure that we can tap our resources the best possible way. But it should never put under question individual approach of any country to the eventual membership of the EU. Uh, and in that context, I think it is really important to see what happens next. You know, because uh, Western Balkan 6 was an initiative that was basically politically endorsed by Germany through Berlin process. Uh, ahead of every summit, uh, there was Berlin and Vienna, Paris, uh, countries in the region had to do this and that. And then it was politically endorsed and supported. So the next one takes place in Trieste in Italy very soon. Uh, are we going to have something really tangible? That's why I believe we are at the crossroad. And a crossroad that will uh, uh, hopefully, if properly responded to, resolve the title of the, of the title topic. We need more integration rather than fragmentation. And that, that's the way forward in order to make sure that we have uh, resolved the long-term uh, uh, challenges and uh, 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 fundamental long-term challenges uh, this, this uh, region uh, deals with. Uh, so EU, in order to support countries in the region, has, in my view, uh, to be uh, more innovative and flexible. We need to understand that we have the common future, but not only in, wor not only in words, uh, and talking about values is indispensable, talking about values is, is fundamental and underlying essence. But we need to, uh, we need to in my opinion, move uh, into something which will bring us uh, very concrete results. And right now, it's not only Brexit, it's also uh, uh, anxiety about what comes next in Germany, what comes next in Italy next year, now that uh, French election has been, uh, has been finished. But even Emmanuel Macron, uh, if you follow carefully, said two or three days before uh, the runoff, he said, EU will have to change. If it doesn't change, there's Brexit. Uh, so we, uh, everybody needs to understand. Everybody has to do its part of the work. It will not come from the sky as a, as a solution. And uh, I believe we need more spontaneity. I believe we need uh, less engineering. And I believe, uh, I believe we, need, we need something which some people refer to as, as multi-speed. Uh, because if we're going to handle accession talks in a traditional way, then it will take so long. And uh, it seems to me that every day, opposite to what it should be, it can be actually more days to more days to wait. So I think we need to apply some some more innovative ways, and uh, that is crucial. Uh, and, and and it can happen only if uh, there there is one more thing which is crucial to, to this mosaic. Uh, hard infrastructure and connectivity is so important, uh, and countries in the region cannot do it themselves. There has to be a formula uh, implying uh, more EU funds. Uh, EU, uh, uh, European Union's lead, or IFI's lead, whatever, whoever, but more EU funds, uh, more PPPs, in my, my, uh, my deep belief, because countries left to their own uh, public finances cannot really do it. And let me give you just a small uh, example. In average, our region is economically growing by 2-3%. Look at uh, most recent European data. Uh, there are, of course, different countries, but in average, it's still 1% to 2% or around 2% annualized uh, estimate for this year. Uh, if that happens, EU dramatically pulls away from this region. We are not catching up. Actually, the gap is bigger. And then frustration in this region will be bigger. And then migration pressures will only grow. Young people will remain disillusioned. So there has to be, there has to be change uh, of the approach. Uh, 
And to, uh, to wrap up, uh, I believe, uh, uh, summing up, I believe again that uh, we are living in interesting times, uh, uh, which is that well-known well -known curse. But uh, I think it is responsibility of all of us, whatever we do uh, currently to sort of try to play uh, a ball in the right direction so that there is a synergy in effect. And I'm sure, sure that we can do that, we can do that together. Uh, thank you so much. And of course, if there are questions, I'll be happy to, to try to respond, although I've already taken so much time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Lukšić, for a wonderful introduction. Uh, you gave us plenty of food for thought that will inspire the rest of the discussion. I would like to kick off uh, the panel discussion with a question to Mr. Cernadak. In your view, what is the potential for conflicts in the Western Balkans today? So I think uh, maybe to put the answer in reverse way, uh, what to do not to have the conflict. Uh, I think uh, the most important thing is that we stay focused and we continue with European integration of our countries in the region, and that we also continue with uh, the relations, developing relations among us, which is progressing in previous years, and I think it should, it should continue. And uh, I'll share with you one, uh, one thing that uh, even I changed my, changed my perception during time. Uh, on the, particularly on this uh, uh, cooperation in the region, neighborhood relations, regional cooperation. It seemed to me uh, too plain, too, uh, how to say, uh, like, like words without the substance, because I thought it was normal. And then you see that uh, uh, we should not take for granted uh, these, these, these relations, and because of the very turbulent past, very complex situation in the region. We should always stay focused on this. And I can recall a very particular example that includes actually Igor and myself. And the first time I met him, when I became minister in April 2015, uh, we had famous case of the small village called Sutorina, which most of the people in Bosnia and Herzegovina didn't know what it was, but it became such a problem that uh, from the perfect relations, in a couple of weeks we came to the situation where we didn't have ambassador here because we took him back to Sarajevo and uh, they didn't have ambassador in Sarajevo. Uh, of course, we, as you know, uh, worked on this and we resolved the situation, but in, uh, in this region you can easily come from perfect relations to very problematic ones, that's why I think this should be very much at the focus. Rega regarding the uh, the European integration. I will now uh, particularly uh, underline the Bo uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina case. For us, it is uh, absolute foreign policy and uh, absolute priority in our politics to continue with the European integration process strongly. Uh, this is one of the rare things in Bosnia-Herzegovina that has full consensus. So you can take a look in only Republika Srpska, only Federation, only Serbs, Croats, Bosniaks as people. Any way you look, this is one thing that is very strongly supported in Bosnia Herzegovina. Uh, and if you talk to people, they uh, will tell you that the, inter the integration to the European family is seen, among other good things also, as a very uh, strong confirmation of long-lasting stability and long-lasting peace. And I'm sorry if some of you heard this before, because I say, I repeat this often, but it's very important. You know, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, every adult person participated or lived through at least one war. Some of them two, most unlucky ones even three. And if we uh, get out of this just 100 years of peace, we don't need any other benefit. So uh, the message on, on this, uh, very shortly, to sum it up, is that uh, yes, the conflict uh, uh, potential exists. I think uh, no, no potential for real 
real uh, dramatical conflicts, uh, especially I don't see potential for conflicts among us as countries. But uh, as you know, if you look at the very political uh, tense situations that we have in some of the countries, including uh, including uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina as well, or Macedonia, or, there is there is potential. But uh, on the other hand, if we stay focused on 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 reforms, on these uh, uh, going strongly uh, on European path for all of the countries and developing our mutual and uh, regional cooperation among each other, then I think we can prevent it. And just one thing uh, to finalize, uh, just small information on Bosnia and Herzegovina. The expectations regarding us is that uh, we will be able, if there is no dramatic uh, development of, of, of some kind in, in our politics, we hope we would be able to get the decision by, by Brussels on candidacy status in the early, early time of 2018. So I don't want uh, this uh, to be understood as uh, something uh, different than what Igor said, because it is really a long way from today, because there is so many things to do. But time-wise, for us, it's a very strong perspective, and uh, uh, we hope to have it and to join the group of four, four uh, countries in the region that are already candidate and continue together. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Sholaya, <clears throat> in recent years we often hear that geopolitics has returned uh, to Europe but also recently in the Balkans. In your view, what is the role of external actors in the Western Balkans today? Thank you, Mr. Edus. Thank you for the question. Firstly, I would like to thank to organizer and Mr. Kentola who invited me here on this forum. Regardless, I'm the first time, but I follow the delivering of these forums even since the many years ago before the sparking. In terms of external actors, I think that they are everywhere around us. And uh, I will try maybe to, uh, to share this, my contribution in three plus one points. Firstly, internal processes, the Western Balkans countries are affected by some process which is usually called unwilling transition because it was more pro provoked by the end of the Cold War and processes that started in Central Eastern Europe. And so that is a very painful process of getting rid of very high uh, authoritarian legacy, for instance, very, very rooted in Ottoman legacy, in socialist legacy. And also it is not the first time that we, we have the reemerging of authoritarian system. It was uh, between the two world wars after the initial phase of liberalization we had at the time also the strong raising of authoritarian system. And actually we also witnessed with the same process. Not only actually maybe, I'm not, I must not be sure at the moment, for Turkey, but also some other countries that also authoritarian role of some leaders is going to increase. What I think is that uh, maybe re regional cooperation, which is also more or less initiated by foreign actors, and in the book that you mentioned, I counted even 12 different initiatives, which are also more or less not originally from the Balkans, but just uh, sparked from international community. And it is a really uh, strong witnessing about the, our inability maybe to find out a way how to cooperate between us. And although with uh, just a very strong authoritarian tendencies that we have to recognize actually, there are possibilities that we, we are really at, uh, see the time that even the European Union is going to give up also almost all of these initiatives and just trying to, to launch another one like Europe or macro regions, which is combination of EU regions and uh, just the uh, Balkans region as well. And the last, maybe, point, it is the role of uh, great powers and other very high actors in the Balkans. Actually, we see that just the re-emerging Russia role in the Balkans. And it is very interesting that maybe the Western countries, maybe they were sleeping for a while, just not seeing that Russia is getting stronger here. And also the new type of role of Turkey, because 
in just in, just in line with uh, maybe the Buddhist doctrine of strategic dip and also a very strong presence of Turkey and maybe just taking count on some local dominantly Muslim players. There are many things that we have to see that uh, that Balkan countries are really maybe uh, trapped you know many other policies but without the uh, or out just initiatives how to say to to put it on and to find out some common denominator on our own and just to try maybe to to make this region um, more stable and more secure but the final point i will address in this short presentation and i will be open for all questions it is also that uh, recent processes that are initiated maybe with some instability in Macedonia. And I think that uh, this is also some heritage of 2,000 years of so-called authoritarian vertical type of power, not of horizontally regulated society or liberal values we intended to build, but we are still, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we are sti still able to build that. This is also the opening or reopening the territorial question. And it is very visible in maybe a few statements not only by Albanian politicians but also we see some foreign politicians that try to to approach to that question in some maybe I, I I hope forbidden way but I think it is not actually and I think that until we wouldn't resolve all that territorial question I think that the Balkans and Western Balkans and Southeastern Europe and in general would be uh, really, really uh, going in uh, some unstable and insecure processes. Unfortunately, my main concern is that the international community has a lot of problem with this so-called uh, Balkan ontology. And I think that there are many so-called engineering processes that they, are, that they direct here in the Balkans. Uh, just, I think, uh, eight years ago, I was on one European Defense Con Congress in Berlin, and it was a really a real consternation when I mentioned that the Macedonia is the first crisis and hotspot in the Balkans and the second on their relations Belgrade and Pristina and Bosnia and Herzegovina, although I come from Bosnia and Herzegovina, I think it is not such a huge crisis like these two previous. Unfortunately, I was right and some others who didn't believe me at that time, they, they now I think they, they can remind themselves that I was really analyzing processes at that time. I really watched that Macedonia is really the biggest hotspot, and I think it is a really crucial question because I don't see that international actors will be helpful in resolving crisis in Macedonia. And the problem is that it will be uh, for a longer time a source of instability. That's the reason that uh, I, I just stressed that that ontology of the Balkan processes. So South Eastern European processes are more mechanical, more engineering, than really deeply analyzed processes about the social, social uh, streams or some other political streams in the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shalaya, for your uh, intervention. Uh, as a follow-up to that question, I would like to uh, ask Sandro to maybe comment uh, or provide further comments on the role of external actors. Uh, in particular, during the 1990s, the region was left to its own devices. From 2000 onwards, we have uh, the dominance of the EU and the US in the region. However, in the past few years, we have the resurgent uh, role of Russia, but also Turkey, and uh, most recently, also the increased presence and influence of the Gulf states, uh, especially in the economic uh, Sphere. So my question to you is the following. Who are geopolitical competitors of the EU in the region and who are its partners? Thank you very much indeed, Philip, for this interesting question. Let me first start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here and giving me the opportunity uh, to share some of my views on these very interesting topics. I will start by underlining the importance of the EU for post-conflict post stabilization in Southeast Europe. It was of essential importance that the fundamental uh, principles of democracy and rule of law and state building measures uh, were transferred from the CSDP missions that were deployed in the region to the conditionality mechanism of the EU accession process. However, the enlargement process was not only about meeting the criteria, it also had a strong geopolitical imprint. 
Why? Simply due to the fact that uh, in the post Cold War Europe, extending borders of the trans transatlantic community eastward, not only towards Southeast Europe, but also to Central and East Eastern Europe, uh, uh, followed by a strong support of the United States, and speaking both about EU and NATO enlargement, it actually changed the strategic landscape of the old continent as, su as such. At that time, it, it obviously had no serious competitors, because those who have uh, who could have opposed had very, very strong internal uh, issues. And also it's worth mentioning that at that time, in the early 2000s, there was a uh, strong enthusiasm towards so-called reunification of Europe in the post-Cold World period. Also, the EU started developing its common foreign security policy and even drafted its first ever security strategy, which was very illustrative of the environment in that, at that time. And I will quote only the first, second, uh, the first sentence, which said that EU has never been so prosperous, so secure, nor so free. So it tells a lot about the environment and the spirit of the EU and NATO enlargement processes. Unfortunately, things started changing in the uh, period that followed. There was a huge economic crisis that struck directly uh, Euro Club. There was a shift in particular of, of US geostrategic uh, focus uh, to the Pacific, and there were uh, fundamental institutional problems within the EU that dramatically affected the pace of the enlargement post process. Everybody here is, here is acquainted with the term enlargement fatigue. This actually unfortunately created loopholes in transatlantic policies towards the region that was, of course, vigilantly used by other emerging players. You correctly mentioned Russia, China, lately even Turkey, and some Gulf states. The first two are uh, in particularly important due to the fact that they were dramatically increasing defense spending and openly opposing the very concept of transatlantic uh, system of governance on the global level. Also, uh, even today, there's a huge challenge to NATO as a political and uh, uh, military alliance that dominates stability in the wider uh, transatlantic community. So obviously, for the EU, it's of utmost importance to um, strengthen the strategic partnership with the U.S. and the other way around. Perhaps it would be recommendable also to the U.S., regardless of existing uh, problems at other pockets of the globe, uh, to rediscover region and start again supporting uh, strongly consolidation processes within uh, Western Balkans as such. Also, let us underline the fact that actually this region is the backyard of the EU. So let's not for forget the fact that this is actually an EU's responsibility uh, in particular uh, to revitalize, if not to um, uh, uh, reconstitutualize uh, 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 its most important uh, policy in the region, and this is uh, the enlargement, uh, enlargement policy. Of course, it will, this will definitely not be an easy process, especially given the current shape and existing problems within the EU and its outskirts. But some developments in particular in outcomes of the elections of the leading states in, in the EU is actually uh, telling that there should be a, a light at the end of the tunnel. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, last but not the least in this uh, round of questions, Mr. Sharmaz. Uh, why Serbia declared military neutrality, and what is the effect of this decision on the region? Uh, thank you for this question. First, I want to thank all the orga organizers for this great event. I'm honored that, that I'm a part of this event. Uh, second, I want to tell that I want to tell that I'm going to speak on my mother language because I do that every time when I'm in, in ex-Yugoslavia countries and I understand that we have interpreters, that's not a problem. And I want to be a crystal clear. Ako nije problem, znači uh, mogu da počnem da odgovaram na vaše pitanje. To sam očekivao kao drugo pitanje, ba mi je tako stiglo u mailu, ali nema problema. Srbija vodi politiku vojne neutralnosti. Uh, i donela je takvu odluku još pre deseta godina iz više razloga jedan od razloga je zato što zbog prošlosti koju imamo pre svega i kraja 90-ih i uh, one nesrećne NATO intervencije, agresije i bombardovanja, veoma je teško uh, 
razmišljati o tome da postanemo deo neke koalicije, mada u svetu postoji samo jedna, to je NATO trenutno, ali mi smo doneli takvu odluku da ne želimo da budemo deo nijedne vojne koalicije i Srbija vodi takvu politiku otvoreno i mogu da kažem da je, ja sam već deset godina u delegaciji našeg parlamenta u Palestinskoj skupštini NATO-a, nekada to nije nailazilo na razumevanje, međutim moramo reći da sve više i više takav stav Srbije nailazi na razumevanje i među poslanicima i među vladama, državama, članicama, a i u samom NATO-u, to je u ostalom i u poseti Beogradu, generalni sekretar Stoltenberg rekao, pa i u poseti našeg premijera Briselu i Šejpu, NATO-u, to je isto podvučeno, znači u suštini niti Srbija traži da postane deo NATO-a, niti NATO zove Srbiju, ali sarađujemo. Sarađujemo kroz partnerstvo za mir i sarađujemo kroz individualno partnerski akcijni plan koji imamo ili IPAP. I mogu vam reći da smo prošle godine imali otprilike 120 aktivnosti što sa NATO-om, što sa vojskom sa američkih država ili nekih drugih koje je Srbija sprovela i koje radi. Tako da mi mislimo da je taj okvir sasvim dovoljan za naš strateški cilj Srbije je da postane deo Evropske unije, da postane deo Evropske porodice, smatramo da nam je tu mesto, smatramo da smo tu trebali odavno da budemo, za to što nismo sasvim sigurno da sami u velikoj meri snosimo krivicu, ali jedan deo mora biti u tom dvosmerno, u toj saradnji mora da bude i dvosmerno, verovatno nekada nismo nailazili ni na potrebno razumevanje u strane Evropske unije, ali... Sada mislim da su stvari dosta dobri i da idu dobrim tokom i da će Srbija vrlo brzo postati deo Evropske unije, a onda će biti u okviru tog bezbednostnog kišobrana, tako da ne vidimo tu neki naročiti problem. Imamo slične situacije i u Irskoj, Švedskoj, Finjskoj, Austriji, koje su vojno-neutralne države, a članice su Evropske unije, sarađuju preko partnerstva za mir sa NATO-om, tako da ne vidimo zašto bi Srbija tu predstavljala bilo kakav problem, mislimo da je to nešto što je i normalno i prihvatljivo. I zaista niko o tome sa nama ne razgovara. Dešava se da se pojavi to u javnosti u Srbiji, ali to kao temu nameću u one političke opcije koje nemaju šta drugo da ponude građanima Srbije, pa onda plaše građane Srbije sa NATO-om, što je plodno tlo posle 99. godine, nažalost, iš uvek, ali u suštini mi vodimo tu politiku, da ponovim, da budem jasan, zato sam i želao da govorim na svom jeziku, vodimo politiku vojne neutralnosti, ali nismo neutralni politički, pošto želimo da budemo deo Evropske unije, I već kada spominjem sa time ću završiti Evropsku uniju, mi smo i u tom, mogu reći, kolege iz Hrvatske to vjetno bolje prati, ali novonastalom bezbednostnoj politici Evropske unije koja pokušava da proširi svoje bezbednostne kapacitete, pa i sa nekim jedinicama i stvaranjem bezbednostnih snaga, Srbija je već postala sastavni da od toga imamo jednu jedinicu u okviru garnizona ili tako nešto hobruk u Grčkoj, već smo sastavni deo toga, učestvujemo u mirovnim misijama Evropske unije i trenutno smo sedma država u Evropi po broju naših pripatnika u mirovnim misijama, to je još jedan okvir kroz koji se rađujemo. Hvala puno. Now we switch back to English language and I would like to ask Mr. Lukšić. Um, the question about democracy. Many people talk about the backslide of democracy, not only in the region, but wider. We have uh, regimes which increasingly don't look like liberal democracies uh, in, in, in our neighborhood. Uh, I don't want to single out any of those, but uh, we all know what I have in mind. And also in the region, we have deterioration of media freedoms and uh, and other aspects of um, democracy. So, in your view, what is the state of democracy in the region today, and how does it affect regional security? Well, that, that is indeed a very interesting question, especially against uh, some of the elements of the background I tried to describe, because 
on one hand we have uh, some positive uh, 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 forces on the other hand you have examples of uh, populism and uh, similar uh, policies that can uh, change the way you perceive things but it also depends when you look at the region to what actually you make a comparison with. If we make a comparison with what we used to have again 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, I'm uh, still positive that in most of the cases the uh, situation is better, that there is uh, more democracy. Uh, but if you ask me if we should be happy with the, the level we have reached, of course not. And I think the way uh, the European Union puts that into the integration enlargement scope, uh, emphasizing the need for rule of law, economic governance, and public administration reform, it is really a proper approach. Uh, the, the problem I, I have uh, with, with uh, our region is, is sometimes I get the feeling that uh, governments do things only at the last moment and only if pressed. Uh, and that's the perception we create elsewhere. Uh, so be it wrong or right, uh, but that's the perception we create elsewhere. And that is indeed a problem, because then your credibility corrodes. And uh, it seems that there's always a sort of a transaction going on over, okay, we'd like to uh, do this and that, but you need to give us this and that in, in your favor. And that is really a problem, uh, because uh, uh, what characterizes transition, in my view, is that it is made not only of political reforms, where you introduce changes to political system, multi-party system, and so on, then you privatize, you liberalize your economy, and so on. But if you don't do enough in terms of uh, supporting the creation of new set of values, then transition never ends, and the costs are getting higher. Uh, and then it is most visible in the fact that institutions remain weak, and unable to, to move ahead. Unfortunately, some of the processes going on uh, around uh, may actually, uh, 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 may actually uh, uh, distort the process uh, and may actually uh, impede the process of further democratization. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, one of the first perceptions we need to change is that we don't do reforms at the last moment and only if pressed, but because we believe in, in the long-term goals we have set forward. Thank you. Uh, Sandra, let me now jump, jump to you uh, in order to get <coughs> longer. 2016 was, according to many, a year of populism. We, we saw what happened at the presidential elections in, in the US. We had the, the referendum for Brexit in the UK. So how has the rise in populism affected uh, our region, the Western Balkans, in your view? And what are the potential consequences in the future? Well, thank you very, very much indeed, Phil, for the question. There is an overarching impression that the populism is actually turning countries inwards, alliances included. So we are now facing the problem of rotten carrot, and if not broken, then for sure a fragile state, when we speak about legitimacy of the conditionality mechanism. Um, the process of Europeanization is also stalled, at least to a certain extent. And there is lack of serious debate about prospects of the enlargement process in the period to come. So there's a question mark caused, caused by this issue of self-concentration. Uh, what to do with the Western Balkans region? Should we only contain it? This actually creates an image that the transatlantic community either does not have the capacity or an interest to control or to tackle the to tackle the challenges in the region itself. And there's a feeling that by selecting mainly populist leaders in the region, it predominantly selects stability over transparent way of governance. It selects predictability over procedure. Um, and not only that the rise in pop of populism in the West is obviously sending a very bad message to the region, but there are a couple of post-socialist states that I will not men mention either, that are actually sending, and that the developments in these states are actually sending the message that actually you can bridge the fundamental um, 
uh, rights in the de democratic system, that you can endanger independence of fundamental state institution, that you can actually suffocate freedom of speech and of the media without facing severe uh, consequences in the post-accession period. What does it say? It actually tells us that the crisis is beneficially for populism because everybody is focused on efficiency rather on transparency of the decision-making process and procedures. And let us not for forget the fact that the populism does not come out of the blue. It's a consequence of the crisis. Look, even the period between the First and the Second World War. On the other hand, the democracy, especially the, when we speak about decision-making process in the European Union, is time-consuming and it's complicated. And when speaking about the region, it's obvious that the region has lots of problems with populism, especially at the local level where transpar transparency checks and balances are very weak and actually barely visible. So it's very difficult to detect populism on the rise and especially to sanction uh, misdeeds that are happening every now and then. This is, of course, also suiting for political trade-offs before and after the elections, you know. And this actually helps populists to gain an image of the only ones who can internally provide welfare and externally provide security, stability, or predictability, if you wish. Therefore, it seems to me that it is of fundamental importance not only to rhetorically fight back populism, but to, to understand the essence of the root cause of the very phenomena. So I would say that the elitization of the governing process, relegitimization re of the governing process, in particular at the EU level, more transparency, less inequality, creating a sense of, of weakness among uh, citizens that are living under, under the framework of our type of governance, creating trust in, in institutions in particular, is actually a list of key words for fighting against populism on EU, NATO level, but in particular on the regional level as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, Mr. Shormaz, uh, let me go back to the question of external influences and uh, with, with a special focus on Serbia, obviously. Um, in recent years, Russia, as we and our panelists uh, have noticed, that um, has increased its influence in the region. At, at the same time, simultaneously, relationships between the West and Russia have significantly deteriorated due to the crisis in Ukraine, but other hotspots in, in the Middle East and elsewhere. Um, how is that affecting regional stability and prospects of sustainable peace in, in, in the Balkans? Is, do you see the role of Russia as, uh, as a factor of stability or as a potential factor of destabilization in the region? A ovaj prostor ima tradicionalno, kad kažem prostor, ne mislim znači samo na Srbiju, možemo reći to slobodno podjednako, ako ne čak i više, ovaj, kroz istoriju dobre odnose sa, sa Rusijom i Srbija i Crna Gora i ostale, Bugarska, na primjer, i ostali delovi Balkana ili, ajde da kažem, ovog našeg prostora Zapadnog Balkana. I mislim da je plodno tlo uh, Balkan za delovanje Rusije i za to šta Rusija želi da, da ovaj poruči našim građanima ili našim državama. To je nešto što je činjenica, to ne možemo da, da kažemo da nije tako bilo i ranije i ranijih godina. I naravno da ima uticaja i čini mi se da je čak i kada pogledamo interese svetskih sila pa i Rusije koja traži neki svoj interes Verovatno i njima interes da sa problema u kojima se nalaze, jer njima je mnogo važnije da reše pitanje sa Zapadom, kao što ste sami rekli, odnosa zbog Ukrajine, pa evo i danas se to, baš i današnji dan, juče se to dešava u Vašingtonu, oko Ukrajine ili Gruzije ili nekih drugih problema, Sirije i tako dalje. Čini mi se da je čak i logično da Rusija pokušava na nekim drugim prostorima da bude prisutna ili čak i da ih destabilizuje kako bi povukla ovaj, pažnju sa, sa tih problema koji, koji postoje. Ali ne verujem, čini mi se da nije baš naročito ni uspešno u tome, a i jednostavno to sve zavisi od odnosa velikih. Mi tu nešto mnogo ne možemo da promenimo. Oni će o tome da razgovaraju i oni će se oko toga 
dogovoriti, ali kao što kaže jedna poslovica, kad slonovi vode borbu, trava strada. Tako da mi tu sad moramo da gledamo kako da u celoj toj geostrategijskoj borbi prođemo što bolje ili da nemamo štetu nekakvu. Nije samo Rusija ta koja je prisutna, prisutna je recimo i Turska, to o tome je isto malo pre se govorilo, ali je nešto što bih ja želeo da izgovim ovde što je primećeno poslednjih godina, ajde da kažemo par godina u Srbiji, da turski investitori sve više i više dolaze u Srbiju i nije razlog to samo što je, ne znam, što i mi nudimo dobre uslove za poslovanje, nego izgleda da odlaze odande, da je tamo nestabilno zbog svih ovih događanja poslednje vreme, pa traže neki drugi prostor za svoje poslovanje i dolaze recimo u moj grad Smederevo na Dunavu, već dve firme su otvorene, dolaze u Niž, dolaze u Pirot, ne idu u Novi Pazar, sad su čak i pazarci malo zbunjeni, da kažemo bošnjaci u Srbiji, što se to tako dešava. Turska je takođe prisutna, a i ono što mi znamo i što je problem u našim odnosima sa Turskom, ona je možda i najveći patron tom pokušaju da Kosovo i Metohija bude nezavisna država. Verovatno imaju najveću pomoć od Turske, iako to tako ne izgleda kada vidimo. U svemu tome, naravno, su i Sjedinje američke države, pa evo videli smo ovaj slučaj Makedonije, došao je jedan službenik iz Bele kuće i malte ne rešio sve za jedno večer. Znači, Sjedinje američke države su i dalje njihova ruka daleko stiže i daleko su verovatno i dalje najuticajniji na ovom prostoru, ali onaj ko je nama najvažniji kao partner, strateški partner je u svakom slučaju Evropska unija i mi se na taj način ponašamo i na taj način odnosimo i ti pregovori su nam najvažniji. Tu mogu da se složim sa kolegama koji su malo pregovorili, imamo jedan veliki problem što praktično Samo Crna Gora i Srbija vode pregovore o tome da postane punopredni članovi Europske unije kroz otvaranje i zatvaranje poglavlja. Ostali jesu kandidati, ali nikako da krene taj konkretan proces poput Bosne, Albanije ili Makedonije. Mislim da to izaziva dodatne probleme. Pa vidimo kada su gotu pitanju i izbori, onda imamo novi problem u regionu u bilo koje od ovih država, onda se to prenosi nestabilnost. Imamo priče o Velikoj Albaniji, svađe, rasprave, medijska prepucavanja, imamo priče, ne znam, o Velikoj Srbiji, imamo strašenje od strane političkih činilaca u Hrvatskoj. Kada je god kampanja, uvek je nekako Srbija postaje tema, iako se trudimo samo da budemo regionalno prijatelji i saradnici i da biznis sveta, ali nažalost nekako se svi ponašamo na taj način još uvek, zato što ta perspektiva mora po meni, i time će na to biti zaključiti, mora da bude mnogo jasnija i samim građanima, a i političkim elitama ta perspektiva članstva u Evropskoj uniji. I to je nešto što na čemu je potrebno svi da sarađujemo i naravno da što pre postanemo deo te porodice. Hvala. Mr. Crnodak, 20 years ago, many people expected that uh, European integration, democracy, and the market economy will solve the uh, remaining ethnic conflicts and, and problems in the region. Uh, today, we see that this promise was not uh, fully fulfilled. We have stalemates in Bosnia, political stalemate. We have in Macedonia recently. We have unresolved still uh, issue of uh, Belgrade-Pristina relationships. Um, who should break the deadlock? Is it the citizens with some sort of new massive mobilization? Is it the politicians and political elites who should change the way of doing things? Or is it the international community that needs to do something differently? It's uh, not easy to answer in, 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 in one or two <laughs> sentences, yeah. It is, uh, well, First of all, I think uh, we should have some uh, adequate movements of, of, from all three of those angles that you, that you mentioned. Uh, first of all, I think the citizen section should be much stronger. And uh, at least in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we are not satisfied with, with, with this. And uh, uh, we are not getting increase, but rather decrease of people wanting to take part of any kind 
in the in, in, in the public, in the in the you know in the social social activities, social events. Uh, so I think there would there would have to be more clear, impartial criticism and positive democratic pressure by people. And uh, I hope it doesn't sound odd for me as minister saying this. I really think it should help. It would help uh, politicians as well. But politicians are key here, and uh, uh, I think that. Uh, if we speak about particularly Western Balkans, it is of the, of the greatest importance that politicians are more responsible, more accountable. We discussed in previous round uh, prospects or, or potentials for conflict. You know, and and, and uh, I, I, I said how important I see uh, it is to have good relations among the countries. But still, even though even though I know, and we probably all know here that it's, it's, it's just for the daily politics. But still, when we have elections, when we have campaigns, we use some rhetorics uh, that is not so responsible, so not so accountable. And, uh, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't want to now mention examples because I would mention two or three and m miss two or three important and maybe it could be it could be uh, understood wrongly. I don't want to, don't want this to happen. But uh, I think uh, more accountability by politicians definitely uh, needs to needs to needs to happen. And when it comes to international community, uh, particularly here, I think uh, European Union because it is the place where we are all uh, decided. We have all decided to go to. Uh, I think I think we should not go back. Uh, to time, at least not in uh, in a way that it ha used to be in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where international uh, international presence or international representatives would be actually delivering changes, even imposing laws like we had. That kind of of of, of, of influence uh, we should not go back to definitely. Uh, but I think. Uh, what we could uh, have most benefit from is to get clear messages on on what is what is really uh, standard, what is really uh, mm -hmm. something that is uh, uh, good for democracy, for stability of the of the society of the institutions, and to also be uh, very clear on 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 what's wrong. I'm not saying. And I'm not, of course, appealing on uh, on anybody to take sides in domestic political fights, but uh, on some positions, when it's uh, when you can see clearly that there's something wrong, I think we should get uh, this position uh, strongly underlined by the key people uh, from Europe, and it should be done impartially. I think this would, this would be the best the best uh, thing to come from them, and. Uh, uh, just to finish, one thing, you know, listening to all the comments of my colleagues here, uh, it is clear that we are so much, we are so much, you know, uh, together in this. Uh, with our mentality, with our habits, with our uh, weaknesses of our societies. And yes, it's right what uh, Mr. Sharma said. Uh, of course, Serbia and Montenegro are quite in front when it comes to European integration, but still, uh, I, I think uh, th this this thing that that we have so much things in common should tell us that we work much more uh, closely together. And uh, Igor said that uh, uh, governments you usually uh, do uh, most of the things at the very last moment. We do everything, even in our our lives, at the very last moment. It's the habit of the region. One one example, and also through through some jokes you can hear in the region, you see that we are pretty much pretty much the same. Uh, recently in Belgrade, I heard I heard a joke uh, that they spoke that told me about Serbs and, uh, and and Serbia, and you can you can you can definitely uh, apply it in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
within within uh, you know any any part of Bosnia Herzegovina or maybe here I, I will not speak but uh, for example they they asked me do you know how you how you can recognize a uh, uh, man from Serbia in a restaurant anywhere in the world they put salt and pepper before they try you know so and that we 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 do this the same so these are of course small things not not uh, the substantial ones we speak but it's uh, pointing uh, at 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 the fact that we have so many things in common and uh, during the integration process after it's finished once one uh, one moment in the future we are always going to be next to each other and that's this is my key key message that we need to be uh, resolving as many uh, problems and and facing as many challenges together as possible thank you Thank you for ending on a positive note. And we will finish uh, the panel, the first round of uh, interventions with Mr. Sholaya. More than 10 years ago, you wrote a book which was entitled The Balkans in Euro-Atlantic Rift. It increasingly, transatlantic trans rift. Uh, it increasingly looks like as if the region is in the Euro-Asian rift nowadays. Uh, does the region have alternative to Euro-Atlantic integration, in your view? Honestly speaking, and shortly, it, my answer is yes. But uh, the other row is how. Until 2007, NATO in almost entire Europe was the only game in the city. And there are many Euro-Atlantic enthusiasts, and uh, they worked very actively on such a type, not of NATO military alliance solution, but more on cooperation model of security. It was very interesting. But uh, since the 2007 and very famous Putin speech on Munich Security Conference, when he stressed just the imbalance of in conventional arms system in Europe, I think that, and also following the financial economic crisis the, 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 the year after. I think that the uh, uh, relations in the Balkans started to change very dramatically. It was more and more and stronger and stronger Russian presence in, in the region. And it was firstly and dominantly it was economical and just through few very simple processes but I think econ economically very interesting the uh, so-called privatization or purchasing of the entire petrol industry in uh, Serbia and the Republic of Serbska as well. And it's quite clear that such economical presence uh, is usually followed by stronger and stronger political presence and influence, and also with just using many other things. So it's at the moment there are two strategies and the firstly, there is your Atlantic integration strategy, which is now becoming more geopolitical question, although I think still that it is more a question of values. Because you know, the NATO and the allies, there is a question of uh, liberal values, which is the main pillar of the NATO integration after the Cold War. During the Cold War, it was just the collective defense and so Another thing is that, uh, on the other hand, we have a Russian presence and just an attempt to organize Euro-Asian economic cooperation, maybe Euro-Asian Union or whatever, should be following, I don't know, at, at the moment and nobody knows. But there are two philosophies and few times I had the opportunity to stress that uh, in terms of NATO, there are uh, strong and long processes and very complicated processes of transformation, which is not only in the, in, in the domain of defense or security, it's also, it, 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 it just encompasses the entire society because not armies or defense systems uh, used to become NATO members, is the, is, is the position for entire states and countries with all their capacities. And in that standard, there is just in, in case you to become a, a NATO member, you can take account of investments. This is some sort of standard. Russia came with the direct investments. And just I asked many people, in case that somebody would be a politician, 
what would be they choose what they choose now politicians dominantly take the prime chance that is investments immediately particularly if you have just emotionally very correct relations with Russia that are based on Slavic arc I used to call it or, or orthodoxy or on the other hand post-socialist legacy as we, as we had that is a very strong presented and that's the reason that now we have to to, to talk about the euro atlantic processes and I think we have to, to pose one question what is the process that lead us to the stability and security in the region. I would like to compare it with the, with the Scandinavian countries. You have Sweden, which is formally neutral, but neutrality today is not position. If you're surrounded by NATO countries, who would guarantee your neutrality? NATO and Finland as well. Serbia is also surrounded by NATO countries. Who has to, to guarantee to Serbian neutrality, but I think the question is, are we able to develop a cooperative model of, of security in order to, to plug in much more actors? And I think that if NATO and Russia have some disputes on a global level, in the Balkans, which is usually, and it has, it was usually a periphery of the entire global process and in the European processes, it is still in periphery of the processes. The Balkan is not in the focus of the main political attention. And I think that we can try to show that it is a, a region of reconciliation, of coordination and harmonization, particularly in terms we have few hotspots which are potentially uh, just uh, maybe some sources like, of, can, of crisis. Can you just uh, wrap up because we need to have some time for discussion. Okay, ju 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 just, to, just to say, to, that, that's okay, I, I can, I can co conclude that. Thank you so much, uh, and sorry for interrupting you. I would just like to hear the questions and answers from the audience. We have one question, uh, gentlemen, in the second table, and then maybe we can take a few more. Uh, we have two questions uh, from the gentleman in the second, at the second table there. Uh, gentlemen in the first row, and let's take those four and then see how it goes. Good afternoon to all. Thank you for such a great panel. My name is Dejan Miletic. I'm professor from Belgrade. I'm leading center for globalization studies. Uh, especially I want to thank moderator for such a great questions. It was very interesting to hear them. Uh, and every question should be round table, I think. I will first refer to Mr. Schomers shortly uh, and his uh, policy of neutrality, or better to say, uh, as a representative of a leading uh, political party from Serbia uh, and the uh, uh, government which is promoting policy of neutrality, for me as a scientist and somebody who is a political analyst, uh, I can clearly see uh, limitations of such a policy. And I'm hoping that this is not the last word of uh, a leading political party from Serbia. But my question will refer to Mr. Igor Lukšić. The title of our panel is Integrations and Desintegrations. From Serbia perspective, we can clearly see that there are tendencies of Albanian integration in the region or better to say, tendencies of uh, ideas, promoting of ideas of Great Albania. How you see Albanian factor in our region, or, and do you see uh, those te tendencies as something which is realistic and threatening the security in the region? Thank you very much. And also, maybe the other panelists would, would like to answer such a question. Thanks, let's minutes. take uh, three more, please. If you can just introduce yourself as well. Hello, everybody. My name is Serem Djerji. I come from Kosovo. And I'd like to congratulate Mr. Lukšić and everybody who is Montenegrin here for entering to NATO, the membership. Congratulations. Uh, I have two questions. Mr. Lukšić, it's nice to meet you in these kind of conferences on security in the Balkans. 
uh, one for His Excellency and one for the, uh, my apologies, uh, Shormaz. Uh, Mr. Shormaz, first of all, I like your clothing. You look very smart, red and black. Um, Mr. Lukšić and His Excellency Mr. Cernadak, membership to NATO as Montenegro and as Bosnia, does it help to become members of EU faster or in, it, in which way it would help on membership to EU? And how that should reflect to Kosovo? Um, to Mr. Cernadak, uh, sorry, Sharmaz, uh, you said neutrality. How come the Serbian military wants to occupy Kosovo? Thank you very much. Next question. Uh, thank you. Dear panelists, dear participants, my name is Danko Aleksic and I am a PhD student in the Faculty of Political Science, University of Belgrade. Uh, I have two questions. So one question for Mr. Cernadak and question for uh, Mr. Shormas. Uh, so, Mr. Cernadak, you mentioned that uh, within uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina there is a p clear political consensus about uh, EU membership, but as we, all, uh, as we all know, that is not the case with uh, potential NATO membership. Uh, so, having in mind that you are, uh, I can say, a prominent political figure in the uh, Republic of Srpska, uh, I would be very happy to hear some of your remarks, or let's say uh, personal opinion regarding uh, uh, NATO membership. Uh, uh, so, are there uh, any arguments regard, uh, uh, aside of emotional ones, so against that membership? And also for uh, Mr. Shormaz, uh, what we call uh, military neutrality of Serbia uh, is basically one paragraph of uh, one resolution. Uh, so, technically one sentence of, of one uh, uh, resolution of parliament. Uh, so, that resolution doesn't even, even have a... a word neutrality in, uh, in the title. So my question is, uh, don't you think that it's uh, not serious enough, let's say, to treat such a kind of uh, important strategical issue uh, for one country by one paragraph, one sentence of a resolution? Thank you. I think we have one more question on the table. I hope it's not about the fashion style of our Hi there. My name is Brian Ebel from the Embassy of Canada. The session this evening is about fragmentation and integration. One of the strongest forces, as we know, for fragmentation in the region is ethnic nationalism. Ethnic nationalism is strong for a number of reasons. There's historical grievances, but it's also a convenient way for politicians to win votes and a convenient way to hide problems. I'd like to ask the panelists if um, they would be willing to identify which politicians in the Western Balkans have been most, most restrained in the use of ethnic nationalism? Which politicians have been most focused on an agenda that serves citizens, jobs, and the economy? And which politicians are most forward-looking and avoid the dead end of nationalism that leads only to fragmentation? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for excellent questions. Uh, I, I'm afraid that we'll have to stop uh, receiving questions for the time being and uh, allow our speakers to, to respond. We have uh, six or seven minutes, which means that you will have to really keep your answers short. Uh, is there anyone who would like to start? Or maybe we should start uh, with you, Mr. Lukšić? Well, I've, uh, I've received uh, two and a half questions. Uh, well, listen, uh, I, I think the first question related to, uh, you know, the Great Albania project and uh, what you've just asked uh, uh, a, a participant from the Canadian Embassy referring to ethnic nationalism, in a way, are connected. Uh, you know, let's, let's, be, let's be fair. Uh, historically, I think uh, call for Great Serbia was 50 years younger than call for, or older, sorry, for, than call for Great Albania. So, and we've seen both uh, in Montenegro in past uh, 10, 15, 20, 30 years, and even nowadays, there are a lot of people who believe that uh, eventually a piece of Montenegro will belong to one country and the whole of Montenegro should belong to other country and so on and so on. And probably 
those uh, diehards and uh, something like that, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll live to see uh, uh, for many more years in the future. Uh, and it's fine, uh, because there's always nationalism, there's always radicalism, there's always extremism. But we need to make sure that the policies we conduct in the region are going to be proactive, uh, in my view, open, uh, uh, you know, pro-growth, uh, pro-integration, and that's the best cure, in, 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 my, in my view. Uh, so, I, you know, what we're talking about here, uh, whether Western Balkans is on the road of integration, or the road of fragmentation is, is a good title because we've been always sort of on, on, on that cro uh, crossroad historically and it was not by chance that I basically started my introductory remarks with reminding where we were only six years ago. So, you know, a lifespan for, for this region is a relatively short period of time. And obviously, as Igor was explaining, we need to do a lot to accept new habits and new values. But I think it has to be an interactive, interactive process. So, uh, in my view, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm quite confident that in case of uh, Albanian nationalism, uh, I, we should not expect, uh, you know, uh, uh, regional. Uh, we, we should not. We should not expect any deterioration. I'm sure that there will be politicians always flirting with that, just like on the other side, there will be politicians using you know buses or trains or whatever to flirt with other si sort of nationalism and unfortunately uh, uh, there is one more characteristic of of democratic society and that is electoral horizon and politicians are pretty much motivated to do whatever it takes to win uh, uh, you, know, you know the most possible votes number of votes in the election uh, but I think we need to understand the underlying, underlying tendency, and it is, in my view, it is still, it is still, still positive, and things are changing little by little. Uh, but again, uh, I'm sure, and I agree with other panelists, we we we, uh, we need to understand that EU must uh, uh, realize that there is more room to play here. Uh, and coming to the second question. Uh, Absolutely, I believe the NATO membership will help Montenegro, Montenegro achieve uh, European Union membership. Uh, we have always uh, communicated it as, in a way, twin processes. When you look at most of other countries, or all ex-socialist countries, are both now member states of NATO and, and, and EU, and usually either at the same time or NATO came a few years few years ahead. So I'm, I'm quite sure and quite confident that it can only support the process for achieving, achieving European uh, membership because if from the early days those two were looking at the same, the same, same direction. And uh, although context change and, and reality change, but I think that the tendency remains the same. Thank you so much. We have uh, literally <coughs> four minutes uh, and my role is to also keep the time. So in the name of Europeanization, keeping the time, one minute each, please. Okay. Of course, it's not enough for these two uh, quite tough questions that I received. Uh, but on uh, NATO and Bosnia, I'm glad uh, that uh, with you here and uh, tonight and tomorrow is also my dear colleague Marina Pendesh, uh, Defense Minister of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. So you'll hear this, her views as well. Uh, uh, on, on how we how we uh, how we are progressing there. Of course, it's important uh, uh, to to uh, to have these two processes looked at parallelly. But uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that's right. We do not have full consensus for the final uh, decision on membership. But we do have full consensus on deepening, strengthening relations and partnership in NATO, and uh, uh, all the way until until getting getting membership action plan and which we hope will happen soon and I use this opportunity also to appeal uh, to all all NATO countries to to make this decision as soon as possible and uh, on uh, Kosovo I don't know I didn't understand really what kind of uh, reflections uh, you were thinking about uh, when it comes to our integration process uh, we are trying to uh, 
be constructive on these regional initiatives uh, according to the deals we made to uh, uh, to not to have negative influence of the fact that we are not uh, recognizing Kosovo and while this council ministers is uh, in its term we are not going to be reconsidering it but we will work on getting normal as possible uh, life between between Kosovo and <coughs> and us and uh, why the position of Republika Srpska is uh, such uh, really no time for this and uh, I can only say that uh, this very strong position actually uh, was formed and later, later strengthened after 2008 uh, uh, and uh, after uh, self self-promoting of the of the Kosovo independence and the role of NATO later of course it it uh, brought a certain position of Serbia it overspilled to to Republika Srpska and then of course through our mechanism of decision making it was injected into the position of NATO that, that Bosnia and Herzegovina has today and I finish with this uh, still we think that this uh, this frame of cooperation this intensity of cooperation and partnership with NATO is uh, is is uh, very good and it can be efficient also uh, with our our intentions on euro integrations thank you one minute each please who would like that this question of international positions it's impossible to implement canadian standards of multicultural society in the balkans ethnic nationalism is a winning card in the balkans particularly in the just not uh, fully regulated countries, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina constitution is the Annex 4, one of the annexes of peace settlement, and it's impossible to, to speak uh, about the politics without just that national basement. That, that, that is the reason. We need more time to be mature. Thank you, sir. I'd like to refer briefly to the question about the threat of this uh, grand nationalist uh, uh, plans and platforms be it uh, uh, Greater Albania or greater, greater Serbia or whatever uh, would you like to call it. I would opt for not being frightened uh, about it due to the fact that, that, that there's actually no available mechanism for this and political capacity, whoever wants to undertake this. On the other hand, I would be quite cautious and would not underestimate um, uh, the importance of the issue due to the fact that in the environment that we have uh, just explained, it's a great card to play to the local politicians to win uh, daily political points and to sort of warn uh, the international community and the EU in particular that uh, you know the threat is still alive and it can always burst into flames. Trudit ću se da budem što kraći. Znači, crveno je boja dinastije Nemanjića ponosan sam na to. Ako niste znali, oni koji znaju istoriju sada znaju tako da nemam nikakav problem sa tim što sam se ovako obukao i kombinovao. Što se tiče pitanja oko vojne neutralnosti Srbije, politike vojne neutralnosti, da, ja jesam član najjače partije trenutno vladajuće u Srpske napredne stranke u Srbiji, ali tu je bila politika vlade Vojslava Koštulince, vlade koju je predvodio, ajde da kažemo, predsednik Tadić, da ne govorimo o gospodinu Cvetkoviću, to je sad politika ove vlade i niko nije ponudio ništa drugo osim političkih činilaca koji su dobili 1 ili 2% u Srbiji na poslednjim izborima osim vojne neutralnosti. Znači to je nešto što je ipak moramo reći konsenzus u Srbiji u velikoj meri. Tačno je da ima onih koji su čak za saradnju sa Rusijom vojnu saradnju sa Rusijom a ima i onih koji su za ulazak Srbije u NATO, ali najveći broj građana Srbije, skoro 80% je za vojnu neutralnost. Tačno je što ste vi rekli da se to nalaze i time ću završiti samo u jednoj rezoluciji koja je usvojena, ja mislim, 2006. ili 2007. u parlamentu Srbije, ali to nije bitno. Moldavija ima u ustavu zabeleženo da je vojno neutralna, pa se ruske trupe nalaze u Moldaviji. To im mnogo ne pomaže. Znači, mi vodimo politik, zato sam i rekao, država Srbija vodi politiku vojne neutralnosti. Nije bitno da li to piše u ustavu, da li u zakonu, da li u nekoj deklaraciji. Bitno da mi tu politiku vodimo, ali ono što je najvažnije, mi sarađujemo, kao što je gospodin Šolaja rekao, sa NATO-om u velikoj meri, jer smo i okruženi NATO-om, i ne postoji šansa da srpska vojska, a na to moram da odgovim, jer je to nešto što je ovako izrečeno, zaista 
mislim da nije ni primerno za ovaj skup, uđe na teritoriju autonomne pokrivine Kosovo i Metohija, jer imamo međunarodne ugovore, mi poštemo međunarodne ugovore i sarađujemo sa Kejforom, koji inače vodi NATO, koji je obezbeđen za bezbednost dole, nema nikakve potrebe da se tako nešto nameće, da srpska vojska ima te planove, nema takve planove, osim ako neko, ne daj Bože, ne napadne srpski narod koji dole živi, onda mogu svi da kažu kako bi se ponašali u takvoj situaciji. Ali dok pregovaramo, razgovaramo, podržavamo brisavski sporazum, radimo na tome, posvećeni smo tome, nema nikakvog problema i neće biti problem, jer mi želimo da ceo ovaj region, zajedno sa našim komšijama Albancima, bude deo Evropske unije. Hvala. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that we've only scratched the surface of the many issues that will be further discussed uh, later today, also in days ahead. And now I would uh, like to invite you to thank our panelists with the round of applause. Thank you.